everyone. Welcome to Tea Time. That's right. It's Monday night, 8 o'clock. I'm so glad you're here with me. It's January 11th. And I'm going to talk about my weekend really quick um, because, you know, we're not doing too much these days. But pretty much over the weekend, I basically took all my Christmas decorations down. As you see, my my Santa and my Mrs. Claus and my trees gone behind me. So um, I'm just glad, you know, I got to put everything away. And now, you know, we could get ready for more holidays coming like Martin Luther and presidents and people are going to have off from work. And I know everyone's looking forward to like when their next day off is. Um, and what else did I do? And you know what I watched? I watched last night, Ma Rainey's, Ma, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, um, which was amazing. Everyone should watch it. Um, great movie, major performances. Um, I know it was Chaswick Bozeman's last performance and, I needed a box of tissues, really. He's just an amazing talent, and uh, everyone should definitely watch it. As you know, my daughter has COVID, and we've been quarantining here. Um, I did take the COVID test last Tuesday. Three days later on Friday, it came back negative. But Friday night, I actually started having some symptoms, you know, fever, slight cough, cold. Well, today I lost my sense of taste and smell, so... Try to go get tested today. Couldn't get tested. Going to try again tomorrow morning. And the bottom line is, is that I'm going to be right here in my house in Wontaw for a little longer. All right. So listen, that was my weekend. I hope everyone else had a great weekend. You know, did something fun. You know, weather was nice. It was just chilly out. Let me get to my guest because, you know, my hour goes fast. He is an actor. He's a producer. He's a singer. He's such an amazing talent. And I'm so Blessed to have tonight, Kieran. She in here is with me. Hi, Kieran. How are oh, you? Yeah. <laughs> tea time. I thought there was going to be tea. Are we getting tea? I have tea. You have your tea. But the but the tea. My name obviously being Teresa, but all my friends call me Tea. Right. They don't call me Teresa. So we didn't know what to call the show. So I was like, let's just go with Tea Time until I come up with something better. And it's stuck for the last two years. <laughs> right. So anyway, I want to. I was sorry. I was going to say that tea in in Ireland is you just you can't escape tea. It's well. Let me tell you something. I it's on my bucket list because I have to get there, and I want everyone to get to know you personally. You were actually born in Dublin, correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, my in laws uh, were from where um, Roscommon. Oh, and sure. Long- yeah. 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 So it's on my bucket list. I want to get there. It's my, my, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law went with their family. They went to his dad's tiny stone cottage that he, that he was born in and raised in. I was like, I got to get there. I just have to get there, especially after seeing the pictures. So you were born there. You were born in Dublin. And how old were you when you actually came to the States? Um, That's a bit of a mad story. Um, well, back, you were back and forth for a little bit, right? A lot. Um, <laughs> in fact, my parents actually, my parents emigrated um, from Ireland to New York City. Um, and that's where they met. Actually, they met in the Catskills. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. Um, what was that? I can't name, think of the name of the place. The Shamrock House. Of okay. Of course. <laughs> so... They met and um, in the Catskills, and they were both living in New York City, and, and they got married. And when my mother was expecting me, she wanted to go home to her mommy and her sisters. So um, she flew back to Dublin uh, for me to be born. Wow. And we stayed there for a little while, and then we came back to the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And then um, when I was four, I get, they'd had enough of me, you know, so <laughs> they, uh, they put me on a plane. Little Sorry? Child. Well, you were very rambunctious. Little I child. must have been because, you know, they brought me out to JFK and <laughs> put, me on an, put me on an Aer Lingus flight on my own. What? Yeah. Wow. So, and uh, flew off to Dublin. And, and funny thing, I remember that flight pretty clearly. Um there was a there was a famous and the name God, the name will slip my mind now. Um, there was a famous uh, New York City Irish politician, and his son is now in politics. Brian, um, his name was uh, oh God, terrible. I can't think of his name. Anyway, I tormented this poor man the whole flight. Made him read comic books to me the whole flight. <laughs> so I lived with my grandmother and some of my mother's sisters until I was about five. 
Okay. And then I guess they thought they could put up with me again. Right. So I went back to New York and uh, grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan in an area called Inwood. And, um, but every summer, as soon as school would let out, I went to a little Catholic school in Inwood. And uh, as soon as school would let out, they would put me on a plane and I'd be there until the day before school started again. So I, I spent my summers in Ireland. Nice. Yeah. And then when I was 10, we moved back permanently so we were told right but i can tell you that one year we moved between let's see between october of when i was 12 until the following i guess august we moved from dublin to clare to limerick to chicago to lawrenceville new jersey and back to dublin wow yeah so I was getting my frequent flyer mileage going. I was just gonna. I was just gonna say that. Yeah. Wow. So you it's probably. Sorry, I was gonna say it was probably a reason why I became an actor. You know, um, <laughs> always wanting to fit in. You know, so I would be a chameleon. You know, what whatever the accent was and um, whatever the attitude was. You know, um, I would take on take in to you to just to fit in to survive. Yeah. So you ended up, did you end up in Jersey? Did you go to school? You went to high school. Where'd you go to high school? You went to, um, oh my goodness. Why can't I read what I wrote? You went to, you went to Notre Dame High School? Notre Dame High School in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. Yeah. And it is in Jersey. Cause mm -hmm. I was trying to locate it and it kept coming up Connecticut. I'm thinking, I don't think that's right. No. Yeah. In uh, near uh, in Lawrence, not too far from Trenton, New Jersey. Yeah. And how did you do in high school? Were you involved in like the chorus or sports or plays or anything like that? Well, in Ireland, my passion had been rugby. Um, so there was none of that. Um, and musically, when I when I was in Good Shepherd in Inwood, between second and fifth grade, I was in the choir. And the okay. only reason that I was in the choir was because I wanted to be on the altar. And I didn't understand that the choir wasn't the altar boys. I just wanted to be an altar boy. <laughs> and so they say, who wants to be in the choir? And I'm like, yeah, that, I'm in, man, I'm in. And so they're like, come down to the sacristy after school. And and so I get down there and they they said, okay, sing this, sing this. And I'm thinking, when do I get on the altar? Ring the bells. You know? <laughs> and uh, they, they um, sing this, sing this. And then the priest pulls me aside. He said, uh, can you read this? And I said, shh. I think so. So he hands me music to start singing in Italian and in German. And next thing I know, I'm in this choir. And but then I'm also in this sort of little special group within the choir that would travel around New York City singing in hospitals and nursing homes. Oh, wow. And uh, I finally got to, got to be an altar boy. But that as soon as we moved to Ireland, I stopped singing completely and then got came back in the middle of freshman year of high school here. Uh -huh. And I had been in an all boys school, you know, one of these nose in the air places, you know, where we played rugby, you know. Um, <laughs> and suddenly there were girls. And I was oh. like, this place is great. <laughs> there were bosoms to be found. <laughs> so, um, and they had handbags. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. They're so sophisticated, you know. And, um, and then, um, and I'd always been done pretty well in school, so um, that I didn't really do much of anything other than my whatever my honors classes, my AP classes, and all that stuff until sophomore year of high school. And my best friend in high school I was over at his house, and he's he had a little band, and he said, uh, he "said Can you sing at all?" And I said, "Yeah, I sang in the choir between you know second grade and fifth grade." He said, I'm trying to learn this song. It was Crocodile Rock by Elton John. Oh, yeah. yeah. So he said, can you sing this? I said, yeah. So I knock out a couple of bars. He puts his guitar down. He goes down the hall to his sister, who was the bass player in the band, and did most of the singing. And he said, Brenda, you, um, you're not the lead singer anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> that started that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But I had no interest in theater or anything like that in high school. Well, you, after high school, you actually went to Rutgers, correct? College. Yeah. And you yeah. wanted to ma major in, um, or you wanted to study electrical engineering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that didn't like really happen, right? You no, no. I, I was an electrical engineering major. Oh, you, you did major in electrical yeah. engineering. And yeah. after school, you basically, 
was working as an electrical engineer. No, I um, actually, uh, so I was an engineering major. And when I got to Rutgers, I, I, in high school, I'd taken all these AP science and math classes. And so when I got to Rutgers, it was the same thing all over again. I thought, oh my God, I can't do this for the next 40 or 50 years. I'm going to go out of my mind. And I really wanted to sing. Um, my parents were very, very against it. Very yeah, that's against right. <laughs> like we will murder you, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I get but it. I said, listen, I can't do this. And I, I dropped out and I joined a heavy metal band and, uh, wow. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to ask you what was your, what your first band was. It was heavy metal band. Do you remember the um, the name of you, the the band? Do you remember? Oh, there were a couple. There were a couple of crazy names: Travesty, Stormtrooper. You know, anything bloody stupid. You know. <laughs> and did you play a lot in Jersey? Yeah, we um, played like the, the Stone Pony down in Asbury Park, which is a pretty yeah. famous rock club. We we you know we did that those sort of things. It was just a it was a metal cover band, and we were just having a great old time. And I didn't know what I was doing with my life. In fact, it, it, that that sort of took me into my twenties, and um, I got into a fun. very sorry. You were, having, you were having fun and living the life that you wanted to live. I, it's very hard to go against your parents, especially you know, are you being Irish and the Irish Catholic thing? And I'm I'm 100% Sicilian, and growing up with a very strict dad, and me telling him, "Listen, I want to go to high school performing arts." And he looked at me like, not happening. It's just right. not. And, I, and my mother's like, you're not traveling to the city. And I was like, I looked at them like, well, I couldn't understand what the big deal was to them. Right. I mean, now, you know, I'm a parent now. I get it. Yeah, you, exactly. You worry, you worry your entire life. Yeah. But, you know, and then, as, and then as I got older, you know, it was kind of like, I, you know, it, it had to be put on the back burner. Like I was, t you know, telling someone else, you know, life's all about timing. And back then the, the timing wasn't right. I, I did stand up comedy in the early nineties because I, wow. I didn't have my daughter back then yeah. and I was able to do it. And then my career came to a halt when I had her. Yeah. And then thanks to Bob Nelson. And I tell the story all the time. Who's a wonderful comic. You know, he got me back into doing comedy and then I, I'm pursuing acting the last five, six years. So it's never too late. That's the bottom line to everybody who's watching. It's never too late to pursue your dream. I said, I don't care if I'm 90 years old and I fall in and I can't get up, but where's the beef? <laughs> Something's going to happen. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It has yeah. to because it's out there in the, the universe. But it's, and I understand. So you're, you're in this band. And then I want to know, how did you transition um because obviously you knew you could sing. Everyone knew you can sing, but um, you you transitioned into into the acting. There was some point where you said, yeah. "I want to get into the acting," and I know you know you studied a lot. You actually got on Law and Order, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was after I'd studied acting, and um, I uh, I got into a really terrible car accident in uh, Asbury Park, New Jersey, and wow. I had um, I had. Uh, yeah, some people call it a near-death experience. Uh, oh, I've had, I've, had a, sorry? I've, had, I've had more than one of those. <laughs> yes. So I was out of my body. I watched the whole car accident happen. And, mm -hmm. um, and I realized I was making a bit of a mess of my life. So, uh, and around that time, someone called me about doing um, Pirates of Penzance. Do you remember when that was running yeah. in New York? Yeah. Yes. And they were doing it down in Philadelphia. And they said, Do you want, would you come down and audition for this? And I did. And I, I got that, the, the wreck, the Frederick, the Rex Smith part. And um, it was a young lady who was coming into the next show and she watched the show and she said, man, you've got a great voice, but you're a terrible actor. Right. So, <laughs> so um, she said, a friend of mine's teaching in New York and you should go meet her. And so I, you know, I went into the city and I met with this woman named Catherine Gately, who was, a, who was actually uh, James uh, Gandolfini's acting teacher. Um, and she's taught a lot of really terrific actors. Um, and she, she was a Meisner actor. So I did the two years of Meisner work. And then I, then I studied with a guy named Bobby Lewis who started the actor studio. Um, mm -hmm. as a member of the group theater. And so I've been very blessed with the people I got that just happened to, you know, stumble upon. And, and I fell in love with acting and I stopped singing completely. Um, and then I ended up doing a show. I did the soaps and things like that. And I ended up doing a show off Broadway with that Hal Prince had written. 
And um, they asked me if I sang. I said, eh, I sing a little if you want to hear some Led Zeppelin. You know? <laughs> um, but, and then you blew them away with your pipes. <laughs> well, he took a shine to me and he and I, he treated me like a son. He uh, ugh, makes me cry. Um, he paid for my voice lessons, you know. Nice. And uh, um, he, he sent angel. me to his, sorry? He was an angel. He was one of oh, the angels. Absolutely. Yeah. He sent me to his daughter, Daisy's voice teacher. And uh, next thing I know, I'm on Broadway and Les Mis. And then, um, then I'm doing Phantom and... You know, oh boy. Well, listen, don't give it all away, Kieran, yet. We're going to go to our first break. I want to thank everyone for watching the show. Please like it. Please share it. Um, in the meantime, don't go away. I'm going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Fortunato's Pizza and Restaurant is located at 719 Hawkins Avenue in Ronkonkoma. They're open seven days a week from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. You can find them on Facebook and Instagram. They do free deliveries to Ronkonkoma, Lake Ronkonkoma, Lake Grove, Center Reach, Nesconsent, Holbrook, and Selden. And they do catering for all occasions. A, remember, mention tea time and get 10% off your entire order. So, Fortunato's Pizza. Move you pizza to Fortunato's Pizza. So where do you want to go tonight? Are you bored? Oh, oh my god! <laughs> Hold on tight. We're going to coast this. Coaster's Tavern is located at 487 Newbridge Road in East Meadow. Their number is 516-557-2222. Well, hi there, Teresa. It's John York from General Hospital. I am just checking in because apparently you have a great talk show called Tea Time on Strong Island TV. I want you to have continued great success and have a lot of fun. It sounds like you're having a lot of fun. And that's pretty much the key to everything, isn't it? So continued success. I'm proud of you. Have a great day, Teresa. Bye. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Tea Time. I'm so glad you joined me tonight. I have the greatest guest. Seriously, he's an actor, he's a producer, he's a singer. Kieran Sheehan is here. And you've seen him in Les Mis, or you've seen him in Phantom, and he's been on television. The man is all over the place. An amazing, amazing talent. I'm so blessed to have him here with me tonight. I want to thank Fortunato's Pizzeria and Restaurant, one of my sponsors out in Ronkonkoma, Long Island. They deliver to five towns in the surrounding area. Um, if you mention Tea Time, you get 10% off your order. The food is amazing. And their slogan is, Move your pizza to Fortunato's a pizza. <laughs> so give them a call. And um, I want to thank John York from General Hospital saying such beautiful words about tea time. I did have his um, co-worker, uh, co Carolyn Hennessy, on my show, who plays um, Diane Miller. So I'm hoping maybe in 2021 I could get John York to join me. Um, also, Coasters has been with me the last two years, and I want to thank them also for hanging in there with me. Back with Kieran Sheehan. How are you, Kieran? Thank you so much for again joining me tonight. You know, we left um, before the break talking about how you did Pirates. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to know how you made that transition to um, Manhattan and how you did end up in Les Mis. And then from there, I mean, once you're in the theater community, you're in it. Well, I guess. I, um, when when Laura said to me, you know, you're a terrible actor, I thought, well, here's a new challenge. You know, so I went and I met with Catherine uh, Gately and uh, and she said to me, what do you want to do? I said, I really just want to be a rock singer, you know, and she said, I have a feeling about you. And even if at the end of the two year program, you don't want to be an actor, she said, I can guarantee you, you'll be a better singer. Um from what you'll learn, the skill sets that you'll learn over the next two years. So I said, I'm in. And then, um, and I, I always felt kind of the outsider because everyone there was had, you know, they had their 
their, you know, their, uh, M- their MFAs and their blah, 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 you know, from yeah. different colleges. And they've been studying acting since they came out of the womb, you know. Right. And I hadn't a clue. And, um, but I know this is so funny. It's so clear in my mind. November that first year, I was working on a scene um, with a young lady named Maria Brodor. And uh, it was a scene from Barefoot in the Park. And um, a bit of a confrontational scene between the two of us and it's, it's over money. And my entire body kind of lit up like I could feel it physically running through every cell in my body and and to be honest with you Teresa before that I'd sort of been emotionally kind of shut down as a a person and I think that's why the the car accident was kind of a gift right um because during during high school I'd been very badly abused um for three years by a priest and so I was completely sort of cut off emotionally right and so this scene in Barefoot in the Park just opened me up. And, and, I, and I remember sitting at the desk thinking, ugh. Sitting at the desk thinking, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. You know? Right. And kind of like everything was built up and you're regurgitating it in a sense. You know, they say that when you get that actor shake, when you yeah. get that shake, you, then you're, you're there. You're, yeah. you're there. You're so there. Yeah. So I felt really fell in love with acting and um, I'd always sung since I was, you know, three or four years old, but it wasn't really, it had been a bit of a passion of mine at the end of high school and that it was fun in college, but it wasn't something that I thought that I could do really professionally, not at least not on that, you know, not, not moving into musical theater and that. Um, and I really just loved straight acting. Uh, and then, you know, I ran it, I met Hal through the Irish rep and, and he was so kind and generous and, um, you know, uh, uh, but that had been, you know, that had been a few years. I said, you know, I'd studied with Bobby Lewis for a few years. And I did, I, end, I ended up doing the seagull with him that he directed. And, uh, and I, and I love working on the American class, like Williams and, and O'Neill is a big passion for me, yeah. O'Neill and Miller and, um, but particularly O'Neill and Williams. Um, and then uh, when I met Hal, my, my, my eldest, uh, Kyle, um, he was, uh, God, he wasn't even one yet. He was only a few months old. And, um, and Hal said to me, he said, have you seen Phantom? And I said to him, I said, listen, I don't, I don't really like musicals, you know? <laughs> so, right. Tell him Hal Prince, you know, like, I don't like musicals. Those things are stupid, <laughs> you know? So um, he said, get your rear end up to the Majestic and see the show. Because you could, he says, you, you got a young son at home and you need to make some money. I said, all right, boss. I call, actually, I called him chief. I said, all right, chief. Yeah. And um, so I go up there and I watched the show and I thought, oh, I got to play that guy, the, the, the Phantom. Uh, that guy's a mess, you know? And yeah. uh, so I called him at home. He, he was down in Miami at that time. I called him down in Miami at his house down there. And, and I said, I got to play that guy. And he said, well, slow down. <laughs> he said, you've never done a musical before. So right. let's see what we can do to facilitate this. And let's, um, why don't we try and start you out as Raul, the, the, the boyfriend. Right. Raul, and, right. And then we'll see about moving you up. And so um, the, the producers, uh, Cameron McIntosh was a little leery about giving me this, giving me Raul in this, you know, right. Uh, well, because I've never done a musical. I, I wouldn't have hired me. <laughs> you know? Start somewhere, right? Sorry? You have to start somewhere. Yeah. So um, they threw me into Les Mis. And they said, you know, if he can manage a three-hour show and not miss a show, then let, let's see about Raoul. And then, and then, then that eventually became playing the Phantom. And in Les Mis, you played two parts, correct? Yeah. You played um, Barbet and, Babet played and, Marius. Uh, and Marius. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And how long did you do Les Mis? N- not long. Um, it was, it really felt like a, it was, there was real resistance to Hal. He wanted me hired to, to play uh, Raoul okay. in this new national touring company. And he was hitting a lot of resistance. And then suddenly I get a phone call. Uh, Les Mis wants to see you. I'm like, 
out of nowhere. Okay. So they, they gave me, they put me into a track that happened that the track that I was right for, for Babay, there was a guy leaving. And it was also one of the harder tracks in the show because I think I had 11 costume changes and you were, you were sprinting for three hours. Yes. And, um, and it was great fun. It was just great fun. And uh, so I went into, into uh, Les Mis, I would say in July. And then um, I started rehearsals for Phantom in, uh, I started rehearsals October 19th, um, the day after my son's first birthday. That's how I remember. Which you far from your birthday, because your birthday no, 23rd. was 23rd. Right? Yeah. yeah. So um, funny enough, I was doing Les Mis at night and rehearsing Phantom in the day. And I had this recurring nightmare that I would ask Eponine to bring me to uh, Valjean's gates to get to Cosette, you know? Right. And I'd run out there with her and I and I would grab her and I'd spin her around and I'd go, why have you brought us here? We must return. And in my head, I'm going, you're singing the wrong show. You're singing right. the wrong show. And she's looking at me going, what is wrong with you? Yeah, I had that nightmare, like nightly, for weeks. Wow. Yeah. I'm saying, you know, because I'm rehearsing one and then, uh, you know. Yeah. Crazy. So. And, and fun. you joined Phantom. How mm -hmm. long was it before you transitioned from Raul to the Phantom? The Phantom? Uh, I, went, I went out on this national tour for nine months, maybe. And then I came into the Broadway company to play Raul. And then I was in the Broadway company for about six months before I first went on as the Phantom in New York. And how long did you play the Phantom? Um, between, between New York and Toronto. I did it a lot in Toronto. I had a great time in Toronto. Um, I did about a thousand shows. Wow. Yeah. Well, so, well, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure I, what, what years are we talking about? Um, do you know Fred Flintstone? Nineteen. <laughs> um, I was in the New York company from uh, September '93 until January '95, and then I was in Toronto from January '95 until February '97. And then I went on and off back and I'd go up and help out in Toronto. They'd say, can you come up into six weeks? And I'd say, sure, I'll put the mask back on. <laughs> and then I went back to the New York company um, at the end of 98. Um, and I, I did six months and it was enough because between the two roles, I'd done the show 2000 times. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've seen you. I have to go downstairs and check my playbill. Check as, playbill. The, <laughs> as the date on it. I actually, I framed all my playbills. I have all my Claimed on a on a beautiful <clears throat> homage to Broadway. Me. Yeah, and I my very first um, Broadway show that I saw actually yeah. uh, my grandmother took me to, which was Godspell. Oh, fun! A friend yeah. of mine played Jesus in that. You know? Yeah, and yeah. I loved it, and I fell in love with Broadway myself. I mean, secretly, secretively, I always wanted to be a Rockette because my mom put me on stage at four years old dancing but yeah. I'm only five foot two so that was never going to work out yeah. but <laughs> when I go to your first go to your first Broadway show and I'm looking I'm going god I want to do that I want to do that so obviously I involved myself in a lot of shows in school sure. the theater that kind yeah. of stuff so, um you know and you know but being on Broadway, I mean, seriously, the first time you're opening night, tell me, you know what? Don't tell me. We're going to leave everyone hanging. We're going to take a quick break. Don't go away, everybody. More we here on Sheen when we come back. And we're going to hear about his first time on Broadway. <laughs> Don't go away. <laughs> So where do you want to go tonight? Why don't we go to Coasters? Oh, cool. I heard it's a great place. Let's check it out. Yeah, definitely. All right. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Coasters Tavern is
is located at 487 New Bridge Road in East Meadow. The number is 516-557-2222. Fortunato's Pizza and Restaurant is located at 719 Hawkins Avenue in Ronkonkoma. They're open seven days a week from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. You can find them on Facebook and Instagram. They do free deliveries to Ronkonkoma, Lake Ronkonkoma, Lake Grove, Center Reach, Nesconsin, Holbrook, and Selden, and they do catering for all occasions. A, remember, mention tea time and get 10% off your entire order. So, Fortunato's Pizza, move your pizza to Fortunato's a Pizza. No, How I you doing? It's Sal the Voice Valentinetti. Why are you watching me? You should be watching Teresa Connors Tracy. Tea time with Teresa Canis, Tracy Farrell. And make sure you, you you follow Teresa on Facebook. Tea time with Teresa Canis, Tracy Farrell. We'll see you there. I love the way you say my name. I love. Hey everybody, welcome back to Tea Time. I'm so glad you could join me tonight. You know, I'm so blessed tonight to have on actor, producer, singer, Kieran Sheehan is here with me. And, you know, we talked about Les Mis and we talked about Phantom. And right before we went to break, I wanted to know how it felt. Look, it's like your first French kiss or the first time, you, you know, you're with someone intimately. But I want to know how crazy and what kind of feelings and what was going through your head to take that stage on Broadway. <laughs> Um, you know, it's, it's, it is, it's so clear to me. It's very clear to me because the, the opening moment for me, um, was as one of the guards over the chain gang, you know, and they're all on the ground, you know, look down, look down, don't look him in the eye. You know? Oh and, God, I can uh, listen to you forever. <laughs> I can't, I just can't. I, I've seen both shows and I love them immensely. Uh, Dad, shut up. <laughs> So I'm standing there as one of the guards and um, one of the other guys comes down to me and I think it, I want to say it was Gary, a guy named Gary Lynch, who's a great guy, great guy. Um, and uh, came strolling down to me because we're, you know, we're trying to look like the tough guys, you know. Yeah. And uh, he said, he comes over to me and goes, pretty cool, huh? <laughs> and I said, it ain't bad. <laughs> well, that's great, that's great. Yeah. I mean, that's very clear. That memory is very clear. Yeah. Did you have a lot of family and friends in the audience the first time? I don't think anyone was there. What? I don't think anyone was there that I knew. Really? Really? Yeah. You know yeah. what? Actually, that's not true. I think Charlotte Moore, who runs the Irish Repertory Theater with uh, Kieran yeah. O'Reilly, I think Charlotte came. Um, I think that first night because when I left. She had, yeah, I think it must have been my, I think it was my first night. She showed up, she she disappeared after the show, but she left a note for me and a, uh, a Les Mis baseball cap, you know. I think it said when the, the sh it ain't over till the dead lady sings, you know. Um, <laughs> Tell uh, me when you were in your dressing room, the yeah. night of the Phantom, and you put on that half mask and that cape, and you look in the mirror before you go on, what did you say to yourself? Uh, probably eight Hail Marys. <laughs> <laughs> Decade of the Rosary. Um, it would be 10 Hail Marys. Um, so my first time on, I was, when I first went into the Broadway company, I was the, uh, I was the second cover. Okay. And the first cover, a guy named uh, Jeff Keller never missed, you know, and, um, but I get a phone call. I had just moved. Um, I'm painting this new apartment I'm living in. And I get a phone call from the stage manager, Beth. And she says, um, what are you doing? I said, I'm painting. What are you doing? You know? <laughs> and she said, I'm calling you to tell you that you're on tonight. I said, I'm sorry, what? And she said, you're on tonight. I said, Beth, I haven't even had a put in in the show. I haven't been on the staircase. I haven't gone down the trap into the basement. Wow. I haven't even, had, you know, she said, well, you're on. So, you know, I shoot into the city. We, we walk through, we do this, we rehearse the stairs because you've got the, the, red, death, the uh, red death mask on. So you can't see anything. 
Yeah. Um, you're you're in high heels, which I don't wear that often. Um, <laughs> and you're and you're coming down a flight of stairs. Right. You know? So that was you know so it all went by so fast. It's like a blur. Um, yeah. yeah. And then so that was the first that was the first time I was on, and then it went fine. And then um, the guy then the guy. He was sick a lot that week. He was doing it. A guy named Davis Gaines, lovely voice. Um, and so I was either on on the two show days, like I might do Rowl in the afternoon and then the Phantom at night. Wow. You got to the final layer. I was singing everybody's part. I'm singing her parts too. Wow. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Um, so after, like, after Phantom, you yeah. did Liz, and then you do Phantom. Yeah. What what happened after that? What what did you do? Where did you go? Well, um, I started doing uh, I started doing some concerts because I, I found that uh, one of the main reasons um, I left Toronto, and Toronto was kind of the was the city to do the show in. Yeah. Um, because Garth Trubinsky was the most generous producer in the world. So there were guys, you know, killing to, to play the Phantom up there. And um, in fact, Paul Stanley from Kiss took over from me after I left. Wow. Yeah. Um, I was just talking to him a couple months ago. Uh, um, so I, 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 I went to the producer and I said, listen, I'm going to leave. And he said, no, you're not. And I said, <laughs> yes, I am. And he said, I will pay you whatever, you know, whatever you need will make happen. I said, Garth, I'm, I'm going to leave. I really appreciate how generous you've been to me and how you've treated me and everyone's treated me, but I got to leave. I miss my son. And, um, and I was commuting every week, but it was still was, you know, I, I dropped him off at kindergarten and two of us would sit there in the car crying. And I'm like, for what? Because I've done the role. Now it's about money and right. you, you can't buy that time back. No, you so, can't. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I'll go flip hamburgers. I don't care what I'm going to do. I said, I want to be with my son. And um, so I came back and um, I actually started doing some concert work with a woman named Eileen O'Grady, who was married to a very famous Irish tenor named Frank Patterson. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Frank was a world famous Irish tenor. And so I started doing that. And, um, and that led to a couple of PBS specials and Carnegie and, um, and then, you know, doing some, doing some plays here and there, some, you know, TV work here and there, and, yeah. but um, mostly the concert work. And that's, that's been a, uh, up until last March. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it was a godsend, you know? I know, I know. Um, you, tell me about the Irish Repertory Theater. You were a producer and an actor with them. Well, I, I never produced anything with them. Oh, um, okay. But I, I did help create the show The Irish and How They Got That Way by Frank McCourt. Okay. Um, Frank, the Irish Rep does an annual benefit every year. And Angela's Ashes was everywhere. And so Charlotte asked Frank to write a show for us to do. And so he came up with this sort of tongue-in-cheek little bit of history for us to do. And um, and we did that, I don't know, at the Schubert or one of the Broadway houses. And Kieran called me the next day and we were going somewhere, Kieran O'Reilly. And um, he said, what'd you think of that thing last night? I said, I think it might, I'm, it might have legs. I said, if you, if we throw up some videos and add some more music to it, I think it could be, you know, it could be fun. And then they ended up actually, PBS ended up shooting it and it ran, it's actually, the, that piece has run all over the world. Wow. Um and I did it for about, I guess nonstop for about six months. And then we did it in Boston for a little while. And it was fun. It was fun. And they're like family. The, the Irish rep is, is, yeah. is a second home for me. Yeah. That's nice. I want to, I want to know, I want to talk to you about, we have a couple of mutual friends and one of our mutual friends is writer and director, Deborah Markowitz. And um, I had her on my show last year. Yeah. I love it to death. She's a, she's a doll. I miss her. Like I want to hang out with her. <laughs> I really do. She oh is God. fun. We went to Ireland together. Ah, oh, I'm jelly. I'm so jelly. <laughs> I ran, I ran a group to Ireland a couple of years ago and her and John came on the, 
you know, on the trip and we had a great time. Ever run another one, please let me know. Okay. Um, but Deborah is a wonderful writer and director and you yep. were in a few of her, um, her, her projects. You were in yep. what called The Choice. Yep. Um, um, the Writing Room. The waiting room, yeah. I, I last waiting was it last room? waiting. Yeah, that's okay. Waiting yeah, I, I won uh, a, a best actor award for that one last year at uh, an international thing, film festival thing, and then, um, and then we we finished doing another piece, uh, a, a full uh, feature length film called um, "The Only Woman in the World." Yes. So uh, we're excited about that. Yeah. And you also did a um, couple of guys. Is that like, oh, yeah. a, yeah. that's like a mini series or something? Yeah, absolutely. And in that one, she wanted me to um, uh, use my Dublin accent, and uh, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> and he's kind of, he's a little classless and a bit of a, he's an over the hill woman. He still thinks he's a 25 year old rocker, you know, which oh, I suppose, yeah. you know, she's casting by type. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but it was fun. It's fun. She's, she's, she's great fun. She, the funny thing is, you know, this, this whole other side to me, this whole other spiritual side to me. And um, I have a lot of friends who are very famous mediums. <clears throat> I do some healing work myself. Yeah. Um, but the way I met Deb yeah. was she was having this cl acting class or audition class, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so I was there with a couple of friends yeah. And they hand off this scene. And I guess it was a cold reading. And I look at it and I'm like, are you kidding me? Because it's about um, it's about uh, sort of about mediumship. It's about talking to someone who's crossed over. OK. And so I start this scene and I'm in the I tell you, Teresa, I'm an easy mark, you know. <laughs> so I'm reading this scene and I, I start to lose it. Ugh. I'm talking to my wife who's passed. Yeah, know? right. And um, my two friends in the class start laughing, right? And Deborah's like, why are you two laughing? And they're like, you have no idea how, like, why that is so funny. And she's like, why is that so right. funny? She said, well, he's friends with a guy named James Van Prague. And then she was like, she calls me the next morning. You know, James Van Prague. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go do a thing with him next week. You want to come? And her and John came and, we all became really great pals. That's nice. That's, yeah. that's a great story. I do. I, I love her. I hope I hope in the future to get to work with her. Um, we also, um, actually, you were also in Honor Amongst Men. Yeah. Which everyone can see now. Um, and that's a Fred Carpenter film. Yep. And I actually did a Fred Carpenter film uh, myself. Uh, it was called Confessions of the Hitman. And I play a, um, I think I played a hooker. I played a hooker. Yeah, I played a hooker that gets beat up. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so much fun. So I love working with Fred too. And yeah. Honor Amongst Men, tell me about that because um, Joan Jett's in that too and Ed Asner and- well, Joan and I, well, Deb actually cast me in that as well. Yeah. And yeah. Um, she said, you're going to be doing this scene. She said, you're re it's a really dysfunctional relationship between you and Joan Jett. Right. And um, funny because we're in the trailer hanging out and all Joan wanted to talk about was Ireland because <laughs> her real name is, I think is Lawler. Right. And, and her family is from the West of Ireland. Right. And all me, Mr. Rock and Roll, all I want to talk about were guitars and rock and roll. You know, so it was, but we had fun. We had a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And um, yeah, I, I, the, you know, I've shown that scene to a few people and like, we don't like you like that. That's not nice. <laughs> but you know what? That's a good thing because that just goes to show that you've got the acting chops and people, you know what it is? It's like when you're playing a villain and people like, you know, you're not, you're not, you're like so not nice. You're not a nice person, but that's a good, it's a compliment because they're, you're believable, you yeah. know, so it's a good thing. And it's, and you don't want to get pigeonholed and, you know, always being the nice guy. You know, it's nice. No, it's more fun to play the other guys. That's why I love playing the Phantom. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And then well, she cast me in another one, a, a sci-fi yeah. thriller okay. opposite uh, Sean Young. So that was, uh, you, wow. you remember Sean Young from Blade Runner and No Way Out? and Yeah. Which one was that? Oh, boy. 
the title, the title. It slips my mind at the moment. Okay, don't worry about it. But listen, right. um, when we come back, I want to talk about some other things that you were in. This is going to be my last commercial break. I want to thank everyone for watching the show. Shout out to my girlfriend, Grace, and hello, Florence, and Kristen Dinsley, and everybody watching. Like it, share it. We're going to be right back. Don't go away. More with Kieran, Sheeran, Sheeran. Oh, no, no, no. I got tongue tied. <laughs> you see my teeth fall out? Kieran, <laughs> Sheeran, when we get back, people. <laughs> Fortunato's Pizza and Restaurant is located at 719 Hawkins Avenue in Ronkonkoma. They're open seven days a week from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. You can find them on Facebook and Instagram. They do free deliveries to Ronkonkoma, Lake Ronkonkoma, Lake Grove, Center Reach, Nesconsin, Holbrook, and Selden. And they do catering for all occasions. A, remember, mention tea time and get 10% off your entire order. So, Fortunato's Pizza. Move your pizza to Fortunato's a Pizza. So, where do you want to go tonight? Are you bored? Oh, oh my god! <laughs> Hold on tight. We're going to coast us. Coaster's Tavern is located at 487 Newbridge Road in East Meadow. Their number is 516-557-2222. Hey everybody, welcome back to Tea Time. I want to thank Fortunatos for being my sponsor. Um, they're located around Konkoma. If you mention Tea Time, you get 10% off your order. The food is delicious. Give them a call. Remember, move your pizza to Fortunato's a Pizza. I want to just thank everyone for watching the show tonight. I want you to like it. I want you to share it. We're back with Kieran Sheehan, um, who's an actor, who's the singer, Les Mis, Phantom, movies, television. He's done it all. Um, and I want to get back to the, some of the movies you did. We mentioned Deborah Markowitz and all her movies and then um, Honor Amongst Men, which everyone could see it right now. Um, but you also have um, some other things that are, that I think you were either working on before COVID or you completely finished, but you play, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, a head agent, John Wade. And do you play agent John Wade? And I think it's B-I-R-R. -R, Burr, that's the movie with Sean. Yes. Okay. Burr. There we go. We figured it out. Okay. And then what day, date with the narcissist? Well, that's... Um... The uh, only woman in the world. Oh, so they changed they changed the name of it. You know what? And maybe Deb's changed it again. I'm not sure. No, they, do, they do that a lot. I'm just yeah. you know just put okay. The last one is "Don't Trust Me." Played a police officer. Mm, boy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So listen, we have another mutual friend, Ray yeah. Negron. And Ray. Sorry, Negron say it again. Ray Negron. Oh, yeah. Ray, and another mutual friend, Ray Negron, who everyone knows, Bat Boy, Yankee Miracle. And um, so I want to know, Kieran, you actually was in the very first Bat Boy, a Yankee Miracle at the Argyle Theater, which is the only show I was not in. And you played Lou Pinella. Mm -mm. Bobby Mercer. Oh, oh, someone told me you played Lou Pinella. I'm going to have to. I love Lou. Yeah. So you played Bobby Mercer, my yeah. era, sorry. You played Bobby Mercer. And did you did you give the eulogy? You gave the yeah. eulogy in the show? Yeah. Okay. Regarding Thurman Munson, for those of yeah, you. Yeah, because know Ray, no, Ray, no, I just burst into tears halfway through the damn thing. You know? <laughs> so he's like, yeah, just wheel him out there. He'll start crying. It's great. <laughs> oh, my God. It's such an emotional scene. It's hard not to. So how did you get roped into Ray's show? Well, one of my best friends in the world is like a brother of me, and Ray's like a brother too. But um, was a guy named a great name, guy named Greg Yagenberg, who was a world champion swimmer. Yes. Um, and he's he's out. He's in uh, Glen Cove, and with his family. But Greg um, saw me doing a concert um, out in Long Island and wanted me to come and um, sing for his wife's birthday party. And I said sure. And so he sat me at a table with with Ray. Yeah. And, Doc, and Doc Gooden 
And another friend of mine named Robbie Drummerhauser is another Long Island boy. Yeah. Um, he was a cap bullpen catcher for the Mets. And uh, it was a great table. We had a great time. It was, they, you know, they were always like, shut up over there, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I, we all hit it off very well. So I'm very, very close with, uh, with both Robbie and, uh, and with Ray. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just, it's, it's just a, it's a special bat boy family that I'm, I'm so blessed to be part of. I'm sorry yeah. that you like didn't get a chance to work together, yeah. but it's, it is a special, it is, it's a special family. It really is. And I, I miss them a lot. <laughs> I really yeah. do miss them a lot during the summer, during, during COVID, I think back in July, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> you went out and you performed at different hospitals for the doctors, the nurses, and the rest of the staff yeah. um, outside the hospital. I actually shared one of the videos on my page today. And just to put some smiles on some faces um, under the mask, you could see through their, through their eyes that you did that. Um, what motivated you to do that? And, uh, um, you know. Well, a friend of mine, um, I'm a big, big pro, um, I'm big pro military and police. And um, in fact, we're, we're two Ray sons are, are cops. Yes, know, they're both uh, police officers. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I have family who are NYPD and, you know, and a lot of family in the military. My father was army, my cousin, two tours of Vietnam. And um, uh, what happened was a very good friend of mine, a very spiritual woman um, is a Colonel in, uh, in the army. And she did a couple of tours of, uh, of Iraq and, but she works at the VA hospital up in, up on Fordham road in the Bronx. Yes. So she said, Kira, would you, you know, would you ever think about coming by and singing? I said, absolutely. So I said, anytime. So I um, did that. And then Greg's, Greg Yagenberg's sister, uh, Ilya, who came to Ireland with Deb and John and the rest of us. And uh, she said, what do you think about doing this around? I said, I'd love to. I said, I don't even, I, I don't know how to do it. She said, leave it with me. Yeah. So she started calling the hospitals like uh, Mount Sinai, NYU Langone. Um, I went out to Elmhurst, uh, did two things for them because they were very badly. Yeah, yeah. Um, was out at uh, North Shore, uh, went up to Yale, uh, hospitals in I went all over the place. And it was yeah. very rewarding because yeah, it's a, it's you a put a smile on someone's face. Yeah, you know? it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And, um, you know, my husband works at New York Presbyterian and uh, it was rough. March, April, May were very rough months. So, you know, you doing that, I'm, I'm sure they were so appreciative and, you know, just lifted their spirits because God knows that that's what they needed. But yeah. just briefly goes, oh my God, we have like a minute left. I can't believe how fast this goes. Oh, this sucks because I had another question for you because real quick, I'm just, okay, correct me if I'm wrong because we're going to go through this really quick. You became an instructor of holistic studies at the Omega Institute, is that correct? Yeah, I've, done, I've, ta I've taught some up at Omega, yeah. And okay. we, the work that I try and do is anyone who's a sexual, um, who's been sexually abused, uh, survivors, yes. I don't like to call them victims. Um, um, ugh, that's the most rewarding work. That, We're gonna talk more after this. Okay, that's, that's the most rewarding work that I have ever done. Yes. Not the Phantom, not Carnegie Hall, not PBS, not movies is seeing shifts in someone else's soul right. who feels like they're, oh, I'm not alone. Right. You know, right. and if I can help in that, with that through music, yeah. and um, it's, I don't need anything else. Well, listen, our time is up. My, this goes so fast. I want to thank everyone for watching, tuning in. Please, again, like the show. Please share it. Um, where can people follow you, watch you, and... You know, um, well, I'm right now. Well, right now I'm doing nothing. Um, but uh, I'm part of a group called the Four Phantoms in concert, and it's four of us who played the Phantom. Um, and up until March, we were touring the world. Um, so. Well, I hope that starts up again when you're able to do that. Seriously, yeah. yeah. That no, no, we 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 have some already scheduled, but yeah, it was quite the punch, you know, um, for all of us. I know it is. Listen, you stay right there. I want to thank everyone for tuning in, watching my show and supporting me. Um, please stay safe, stay well. Um, and I'll see everyone next week, God willing. Ciao, everybody. <laughs> thank you.
Bobby, are we out? Hello? <laughs> I don't know what happened. 